You're welcome again. We're just uh, wanting to find out a bit more about the history of chiropractic, really, uh, around yourself and also around chiropractic in New Zealand. So if we can just start off with uh, a bit about how you got into chiropractic and how, like a bit about your days studying at Palmer. Yeah, well, I became a chiropractor chiefly because it was in the family. My dad was a chiropractor, graduated in 1927, and... Um, I grew up with it. Uh, I'd come home after school and I'd hear people yelling, but they'd walk out in a straight line, so I figured this wasn't a bad thing. And when I turned, by the time I was 15, I'd made up my mind I wanted to be a chiropractor. And I was doing the professional course at high school and um, I got through luckily and um, away I went after working in the freezing works for a couple of years to save money. And I went over in 1952 and I started in 1953. Uh, my dad, as I say, was well known in the area. He was a good sportsman and very athletic figure, and he was also a naturopath. So I grew up in a fairly healthy atmosphere, and that was what I wanted to do. And he developed a, a cervical technique, which I call a cervical break, as it was a contact that way, but it worked. And um, he also used one of the older type tables that the tummy goes right down. and. To say that people's feet almost touch the head of the back wasn't an exaggeration sometimes, <laughs> but they seemed to get up and walk out no matter how bad their pain was, so I thought that was the thing I wanted to do, and that's how I enrolled in Palmer. So your dad was obviously a huge influence on you? Oh yeah, I would say so, yeah. But I, by the time I was 15, I'd made my own mind up that I was going to go. So what was studying at Palmer like? Well, i got to say it was a little bit different. I was lucky enough. I sound like I'm bragging, but I was uh, up in the top of my class at high school, so I didn't have much difficulty with study. But um, some teachers were good. Some of the instructors were brilliant. We used to have quizzes every Friday morning, and I remember uh, they would quiz you on what you'd learned during the week. Now, some of the instructors, and I can quote Virgil Strang, who went on to become the head of Palmer, if you, he thought you knew the answer, he would let you He'd sort of lead you through, and you'd get the answer and the finish. But there are others that if you started to go the wrong way, they'd let you dig a hole and bury you in it. And that embarrassed the never mind out of me, but it did make me study because I didn't want to be embarrassed in front of the other students. Well, this is the other way of looking at it. I was the only guy in school that had a beard. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and I was known, believe it or not, as BJ because I was Big John. Uh, I was the tall fellow, and when I graduated, I was very friendly with Dr. Herb Hinder, who was the uh, dean of the school. BJ was on the stage, but uh, Dean Hinder was giving out the diplomas. And he just said to me, he said, don't ever shave that beard, BJ. And I never have, so it's, yeah, well, okay, if you want to hear about BJ, um, he was, he was different. He came to New Zealand in 1930, and uh, he was here in Wanganui, among other places. And uh, my dad went up and down Victoria Avenue with a sandwich board saying, come and hear this great American healer. Well, it filled the Opera House, 1,100 seats, so I guess it worked. But um, BJ was a businessman first, and what paid for the school when I was there was the rentals on the Neurokilometer, which was the instrument that we used, the glide instrument. Incidentally, um, my mother-in-law was one of the team of four who worked on the glide technique in the clinic. She was one of the original chiropractors that did that. But um, that was what financed the school. I mean, you were paying something like $20,000 in present-day money to have that neurokilometer for a year. And that led a lot to why other colleges developed. Because if you didn't have the neurokilometer, um, BJ wouldn't have anything to do with you. And, uh, but by the same token, um, hey, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here because he stuck to his guns. If he, if he was asked, what would you do with a person who had an athlete's foot? I would adjust their spine. What if their hair's falling out? I would adjust their spine. It didn't matter where he went, that's all he ever said. Uh, he lectured to the school on an average three or four times a year on philosophy and any book that he had read, he would read it out to us and we had to listen and absorb it. Circus was his other great love. Um, he went down, he wintered every year in Sarasota 
right next to Ringling Brothers Winter Headquarters. And when they came to Davenport each year, he rode the circus elephant up the main street. That was big. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. Yeah, he did. Um, if he ever caught anybody sneaking out of class, you got sacked for a month. That was it. Oh, the other thing you need to know about school when I was there, you had time taken every class. You were assigned a seat number and you sat in that seat. I was seat 99. And uh, if your head wasn't above that seat when the timekeeper came round at random at any time in the class, you were marked absent. And four absences and a quarter without excuse, you took that course again. So the idea being that if you weren't there on that particular day, you might have missed a very important item in your education. And they were very strict about that. And if you had four absences, uh, that was it. You were gone. Fortunately, I got away with it. I actually knew the timekeeper fairly well, so <laughs> I think I missed a couple of classes and then she sort of marked me present. So what was it that got you into the X-ray side of chiropractic? Basically, um, 19, I had already built these filters, but in 1971, I went to a seminar in Surface Paradise um, to hear one Dr. Russell Earhart. And I have to say that in 15 minutes with him, I learned more than I'd ever learned before because when our pathology teaching, and I'm being honest now, we learned the pathology by remembering the number on the bottom of that screen, you know, Paget's disease was slide 34, and I didn't know half. I mean, I knew a little bit, but by the time he'd talked to me for 20 minutes, I totally revolutionised and it totally changed my thinking. And uh, I became a real pathology buff. And uh, I wanted to get my technique better so I could see these pathologies. I still don't know what all of them are, but at least I know what's normal. And if it's abnormal, I refer them out to a deck bar. Yeah. Yeah. And, but um, I was a palmar-specific upper cervical adjuster. I didn't touch anything below C2 because that's what we were taught. We were shown how to adjust the lower back, but we were never allowed to do it. And I go into a practice where it's all crunch, 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 and uh, I'm a toggling all my patients on the cervical spine. I don't want that, I want my God, that back, you know. And, but most of them got better. That was the important thing, even from upper cervical. But um, finally I realised I had to go. So I went back to Gonstead and did a seminar for three months up in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. And uh, I really enjoyed that. And uh, that's when I got into the x-ray side because he was doing the full spine x-ray. And I came back to New Zealand and I wanted to use this technique, which in, I don't know how much you know about x-ray yet, but it employed what they call a split screen technique. A slow reacting screen in the neck, middle reacting sp speed screen in the chest, and a fast screen in the low back. But the problem was that you were radiating as much up here as you were doing down there, whereas you only need about a tenth to x-ray the suit. So the laboratory said, no, you can't do that. They said, you must use filters. And I said, right, where do I buy them? And they said, there aren't any, you've got to make them. Well, that's... <laughs> I started, and they worked with me, I'll give them credit, and um, then I met Dr. Felix Bauer from Australia, who had already done filters for sectional views because the Australians weren't allowed to take anything longer than a 45 centimetre film. And I asked him would he mind if I did some adapt adaptation. I'd already made my own filters, but I liked the way he did them better. He said, fine. And I called them Bowlan, um, combination of our names, Bauer and Nolan. The only problem was in America, there was a chap building filters named Bolan, B-O-L-A-N. And the Americans pronounced Bowlin as Bolin. And I would get these irate phone calls and faxes from people saying, these damn filters don't do what you tell me they're doing, you know. And I said, well, where did you buy them? And I said, well, they're not mine. Yes, they're bloody Bolin, you know. And I said, no, they're not, sir. They're not. And um, so I changed the name to Nolan because Felix Bauer had passed on by then. And there uh, I'm established in my own right. But um, we export them 